Hi, I'm Dr. Brandon Schmidley, Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Evangel University. You're watching a presentation in the Evangel Philosophy Guest Lecture Series. This semester, we hosted Dr. Jonathan Quanvig, Philosophy Professor from Baylor University, who spoke on the New Atheist Movement. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the presentation. Well, thanks for coming. Um, Steve Badger tells me you must be getting a lot of extra credit because <laughs> there's no other reason to be here, apparently. But that doesn't explain why he's here. Um, he actually thinks, he believes in purgatory and he thinks he's getting years out. <laughs> um, and I don't, I think that's confused. I think you probably get, if there is purgatory, this is going to cost you some years rather than... <laughs> But I'm really happy to be here. Um, this is probably the most intimidating environment I ever speak at. This is my second time here, and it really is intimidating. Um, and the reason is because I love the place. I was an undergrad here, 73 to 77, and I had this feeling the whole time I was here that I was around so many people that were holy and I have that same feeling tonight. It makes me very uncomfortable. Um, and that says something really good about Evangel. I don't know how many of you went to chapel today, but chapel was absolutely magnificent, a really deep and important topic. And it made me very proud of Evangel that they're taking a part in this effort to fight uh, various types of social injustice around the world, and I think that's a great thing about Evangel that they're willing to do that. So it was a great thing. If you didn't go, shame on you. You ought to have to go. Um, when I was here, we had to go every day. Y'all are lazy. You only have to go three times a week. And we only got, I think, um, Paul, how many cuts did we get? I don't know. I know. <laughs> I know. But you got more because I kept giving them your ID number when I went in. Do you remember that? Not really, it's a joke. Um, in any case, I'm gonna talk about the new atheism today, and I wanna start before I get into the slides and talk about um, the four people that I'm gonna talk about. I want to say something about my attitude toward these people and toward atheism in general, because there are times when I will be lighthearted and mildly make fun of people, okay? It's just the way I am, that's why if there is a purgatory, I'm in big trouble. I make fun of too many people too much of the time. And um, I don't want you to get the idea that there's disrespect behind what I say. Um, and um, I, think, I think Christians have a really much too quick trigger on writing people off forever. Um, some of my best friends in the world are atheists because they're philosophers or academics. It's, it's not true that there's a greater percentage of atheism among philosophers and other academics, but that's the perception. And um, I want everybody to understand that I'm not disrespectful and I'm not writing people off and I'm not dissociating from them. I have a absolutely wonderful daughter who when she was 15 had friends that she'd have fights with. And you know, just the biting at each other that teenagers can do. And I said, what are you still mad at Whitney? And she said, yes, I'm, I'm still mad at Whitney. And I said, well, what do you want her to do? Do you want her to apologize and then you'll forgive her and it, you'll go back? And she says, no, I want her to go away forever. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, that's a little bit harsh, isn't it? And so we had a conversation about, um, whoa, what God's attitude toward humanity in general is like. We didn't have it right at that moment because it was not even close to a teachable moment, right? <laughs> so you just, you hold off. But at some point you gotta make that leap that God has redemptive attitudes toward us all through our lives and we should be grateful for that. But I am gonna be goofy at times because that's just the way I am and I will make fun of certain things, right? But that's okay because then they can turn around and make fun of me. And that's good for both of us. Anyway, I'm gonna talk about the new atheism. If you wanna see what's up here, down here is an outline. Down here is the total number of slides you have to endure. 
it is a counter. You will be able to count down. I will try not to wear you out. This is an outline with the parts and it'll light up as we go through. And I want you to notice the beautiful Baylor colors. <laughs> they pay me to do this. It's not, <laughs> not, not true. They do pay me, but not to do this. But you're supposed to understand that I'm promoting Baylor in some way. So if you all are thinking about going to grad school and can stomach living in Waco, talk to me. <laughs> Here's the outline. I'm going to do an introduction. You're going to wonder what Drugstore Cowboys is about. I'll explain that. Um, and then I'm going to resort to some really bad arguments in section two. I'm going to talk about two of them in section three and devote more time to Dawkins and Dennett because I think they have more substantive things to say. And then we'll be done. Here's a picture of the new atheists. Um, anybody know who those people are? The main picture is Dawkins. The guy that looks like a philosopher is Dennett. The guy um, hovering over him <laughs> is Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens. And the guy who's looking suave is Sam Harris. So first, let's talk about the name drugs. I've decided to call them the drugstore cowboys. And here's why. Four names, Harris, Hitchens, Dennett, Dawkins. These are very aggressive atheists. Um, there have been atheists around for a long time. None, speak up? Okay. None as aggressive as these that I know of. Um, I did like Ravi Zacharias's term. He calls them hate theists, um, but that's kind of hard to say and to hear the word hate in it. So I, for, I called them the D and H brothers because there's two D's and two H's. That sounds to me like a drugstore. <laughs> So taking into account their aggressive and brash demeanor, we can call them the drugstore cowboys because I'm from Texas, that's what, right? Rough and rural is what a cowboy is. So who are these people? Uh, this is Sam Harris. He's an op-ed writer for magazines and newspapers. Uh, he does have a degree in philosophy. He was an undergrad philosophy major at Stanford. If you get into Stanford, you have at least some excellent test scores. Um, and he has finished his PhD in neuroscience from UCLA. Famous books, The End of Faith and Letter to a Christian Nation. Christopher Hitchens is a journalist, columnist, and literary critic at the Atlantic, Vanity Fair, Slate, World Affairs, The Nation, Free Inquiry. The book that I'll refer to tonight is called God is Not Great, which from the title you think it's about God, it's not. It's about the behavior of uh, various religious peoples and groups and how bad their behavior is throughout history. Richard Dawkins is a British ethologist and evolutionary biologist um, in the popularization of science genre. He's a magnificent writer. When he starts writing about uh, various uh, biological parts and the functions and the the way animals manage to eke out a living in dire circumstances. He's just phenomenal at that sort of thing. The books, uh, among his books, The Selfish Gene, The Blind Watchmaker, which I'll talk about tonight, The Extended Phenotype, and The God Delusion. Last one is a guy, doesn't he look like a philosopher ought to look? I think he really does. This is Aristotle. <laughs> Daniel Dennett, he's one of the most, um, maybe I'm being too kind here, but I think he's one of the most important philosophers of mind, science, and biology. If you put all three together, find the people that do all of those things. He's one of the most important um, in the 20th century. He's really famous for being, for wit and barb. Um, we won't see much of that tonight, but he's got a, he's got, a, it's sort of an inverse relation. He's really good at wit and barb. Um, which turns out not to be matched by the quality of his, his arguments. He can't make an argument to save his life, but he's really effective rhetorically. Um, he has a DPhil from Oxford. Um, maybe I'll say some stuff about that later, later, and he spent his life at Tufts University. The books uh, that he's most famous for, The Intentional Stance, Brainstorms, 
a really understated title, Consciousness Explained, and the one that we'll talk more about tonight, Breaking the Spell, Religion as a Natural Phenomenon. So that's the four drugstore co cowboys. Now, um, without communicating that I don't respect these people, can I um, just sort of make fun of some things for a little bit, please? It's, it's really fun to do this with aggressive and brash people. So I'm going to do it. They're playful, all right? I apologize to the D&H Cowboys. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Karl Kraus. He was a, a German social critic at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, very pointed, very mean. This is about Hitchens. So this is a Karl Karl. Krauss quote about journalists. I absolutely love this quote. Now, the reason I love it is because there are two majors you can take in college that um, help you do things provided you actually learn something else in the process. One is education and the other is journalism, right? These are technique, methodology kinds of things. To be an educator, uh, it would be good to know something. So, learn how to teach, but also go learn some history or something, right? And if you're a journalist, it would be a really good idea to become competent at something else in addition. And that's what the Krauss quote is about, right? No ideas and the ability to express them. That's a journalist. Very mean. Um, I think of that quote when I read Christopher Hitchens. Um, Harris does have a different kind of background than Hitchens, right? He's got a PhD in neuroscience. So he might be a good journalist for science reporting. But that's not what he's famous for. Dawkins is a fantastic popular writer about science, but he displays a distressing foible common in academia. What might that be? Being disposed to wax pontifical outside one's field of expertise. We are all guilty of this, and I'm going to make fun of philosophers at the end of this, okay? So here it comes. This is a disease in search of a name. We must have a name for it. Let's call it expertitis. <laughs> As in, I'm an educated MD, so of course I know how to run the public schools. <laughs> that one is too common to be funny. Or. I'm a scientist, so I, of course I can tell you what's wrong with the humanities. And here's my favorite. I'm a philosopher, so of course I can correct you about everything. <laughs> Dennett. Dennett is the one of the four that you'd expect to have the most refined and penetrating things to say in matters philosophical, since he's a philosopher. Um, I'll let you judge by the end whether that turned out to be true. Okay, so first about, the, about Harrison um, Hitchens. What Harrison Hitchens argue for is that religion in general and Christianity in particular are responsible for some unbelievably bad things in the history of the world. Um, and I actually think Christians ought to read this stuff just to see what religious folk have done. If you were in chapel today, you heard about what um, the unwashed do to cause harm and damage in the world. And the fact is, religion is no cure for that. Religious folk, it often looks like, I, when, I, when I used to teach Sunday school, I, I um, use this image of an inner tube. I have this inner tube theory of sin. You can try whatever you want to do to get the balloon, you know, you blow it up with air and it pops out an aneurysm, right? So you want to get the aneurysm back in, so get your duct tape. I mean, what else would you use? Wrap it in duct tape, right? Pull the aneurysm in, hold it in place, and what happens? It just pops out somewhere else. And often I think of human nature as just being like that inner tube theory. You can wrap it in whatever you want and the junk will just pop out on the other side. 
And the fact is, endorsing a religion doesn't do anything to curb that. It just pops the junk out on the other side when you're done with the story. Now, I don't mean to be unduly pessimistic. I do think there's a cure for this, but the cure is not adopting a religion and being really serious about it. It's not even becoming a Christian. That is not the cure. That's the start of a cure, but it is not the cure. In fact, I think for most of you, there is such a thing as a dramatic conversion experience. Think of Paul on the road to Damascus, the stuff that just hits you so hard, you are never even remotely like what you were before, right? That does happen, but for most of us, it's a grind from the moment of salvation until the end of our lives, hopefully of some kind of improvement, though it's not linear in any sense at all, right? We start out being Christians from a standpoint of self-interest in the most part, for the most part, right? We accept Christ because we are messed up and we know it, finally. Well, that's fine, that's a good place to start. It's not a good place to stay. Because if you're doing things out of self-interest, you end up doing all sorts of really bad things. And the Hitchens and Harris book are really good at reminding us how bad Christians can behave. I guess the word is badly, to be grammatically correct. And I think we should never lose sight of what they're pointing out. But I also think this is important. We need to distinguish what religious folk do and what features of them are responsible for what they do. The fact is, what you're telling yourself as to why you're doing what you're doing is not always the truth. I don't know how often it's the truth. I don't know how often it's just subterfuge. Depends on the person. But often, what you're telling yourself is not really what's going on and especially when there are power issues at stake. Human beings love to be in control because we are smart. Well, at least one of us is. Right, that's what you think. We're smart as long as you continue to agree with me. Right, and as soon as you don't, it's back to that, well, at least one of us is smart. And we want to be in control. It's part of the godlike impulses and you know where that comes from. It's not a healthy thing. And when those sorts of impulses are at work, we often get very confused as to what we're really doing and why we're doing it. And we can say all sorts of stuff. To outsiders, it's much easier to see what you're doing is seeking power. To me, it's the most sinister of the deadly sins, which I think are money, sex, and power. Those are the three biggies. Power because you will lie to yourself over and over. It's hard to lie to yourself very much about the drive for sex, right? I mean, that's sort of out there. And the money thing, everybody wants money and it's not that hard to tell when you're after money, but power is subtle. The desire for power comes out in manifold ways and we all lie to ourselves about what we're doing when we're actually pursuing it. And that's what's going on. I mean, I think people do this in the name of religion. They say they're doing something for the cause of Christ, and they are not. It's something more sinister than that. So when religious folk become Christians and say, go off on the Crusades, butcher, slaughter, do all that sort of stuff, they are religious folk, and that's what they're doing, right? But it doesn't mean it's the religion that they endorse or their religious impulses that are leading them to do that, even though that's what they say they're doing. When you read history, the historians typically don't explain the Crusades by saying it's just the cause of Christ. I mean, what it really is, is some people wanting control. It's about the power issue. So we need to distinguish what religious folk do and what features of them are responsible for what they do. I think Hitchens is the most instructive here because when you get near the end of the book, what Hitchens does is acknowledge that non-religious folk have done incredible damage to the world in the 20th century. Just think of Stalin, for example, right? Maybe 20 million deaths at the hand of Stalin, and he's not doing that in the name of religion. So Hitchens recognizes that. What's the story? Do you then blast 
atheists and agnostics for being responsible for massive destruction like you do the religious folk? No, here's what you do. Hitchens' explanation is the behavior of Stalin is a latent effect of a religious environment that, they, that he never quite escaped. Okay? Now, you should be stunned that he would pull that card out of the deck, right? I mean, give me a break. Yeah, it's, it's kind of cute. It's actually funny, don't you think? It, it's what, you start giggling at that point in the book. But look, if, if we're going to do that, let's play fair. Let's think about original sin, the fallenness of humanity, all the stuff I've been describing about how we lie to ourselves and the fact that um, contra the Wesleyans, there is no perfect sanctification experience that you can go through so that you will never sin again, right? I think those people, the people that think I have been perfectly sanctified at some point, lie to themselves more than anybody else. You better cut down the list of sins real dramatically to start with so that you'll have a good one to check off, right? So I don't lie to my wife anymore. That's the only sin that counts, right? Then I've got a chance at perfection. Well, maybe not. I do lie to my wife, it's really bad. She's here. <laughs> not about anything important. Just where did you put my keys? I don't know. Here's the, here's the general point. The general point about playing fair, the role of original sin. When you have a theory or a viewpoint, let that be Christianity, that predicts a certain outcome, let that be continued fallen behavior by both the redeemed and the unredeemed. When you have a theory or viewpoint that predicts a certain outcome, an observation of that outcome doesn't constitute evidence against that theory or viewpoint. The theory told you this was going to happen, and you see it happen, it's then not playing fair to say, well, that shows that the theory is false. That's what the Hitchens argument the Harris argument are trying to do when they say religious folk cause lots of bad things. It is true, but it's perfectly predictable that that's what will go on. Okay, that's a very negative characterization of religious folk. And you may, be think, I, you may think I'm being unfair to religious folk by saying, by just granting, yeah, we behave horribly. All right. But you guys have this protected Assemblies of God environment, and I'm at a Baptist institution. <laughs> no Baptist is happy until he's dumping on some other Baptist. Right? We have to have wars. When we're fighting, everybody's happy. So that makes me think, okay, maybe it's my environment. You guys are holy. So it will seem like overstatement to you. But we can talk about that in the Q&A if you want. Okay, enough of the H brothers. Let's turn to Dawkins, especially to Dawkins, the blind watchmaker. Um, I assume most of you haven't read the book. If you have, that's great. But look, there's three things he does in the blind watchmaker. The first is he does his really fantastic work on the anatomical details of certain creatures and their complex and amazing ways of surviving. Uh, he's as good as anybody at that. Absolutely fantastic. He does two other things. One is a defensive move and one's an offensive move. The defensive move is try to rebut the claim that evolution, this unguided evolution, could not have produced the things such as, say, the eye or the wing. So he tries to counter the argument, the typical design argument, that these things are so beautiful so magnificent, they must have been designed by a designer, right? Classic design argument. And he spends time trying to rebut that to show that you simply can't show that evolution couldn't have done this. That's the defensive part. The offensive part is speculating as to how unguided evolution might have produced those features, right? So it's one thing to show that um, the design argument fails it's another thing to give an evolutionary explanation of how these features arose. Now, he doesn't have one. He grants he doesn't have one. So what he does instead is speculate about how these features might have arisen by unguided evolution. 
Uh, the point to note about this, of course, is that nothing follows from either the defensive or the offensive move about whether evolution was in fact unguided. If you tell me, well, it might have gone this way or it might have gone this way, that it doesn't follow from that that evolution was unguided. So those three things aren't going to do anything to establish his case that um, evolution was in fact unguided. He then engages in a more direct attack. And the more direct attack goes at a very abstract level. So he says, I'm going to explain complexity. The main thing we want to explain is, quote, organized complexity. Now, what is organized complexity? Well, the kinds of things that we were talking about. So an intricate watch is an example of organized complexity. The human eye, even the eye of a fly, is an incredibly complex system. Organized complexity. We want to understand this organized complexity. So that's what we want an explanation of. Here's what he says. The one thing that makes evolution such a neat theory is that it explains how organized complexity can arise out of primeval simplicity. So the idea is it's really cool. I don't, I, I don't know how to do this without either trivializing or overstating it. So let me do the <laughs> trivialized one. It's really cool if you get organized complexity and can explain it in terms of something really simple. Now, does it follow, or is that equivalent to saying the only way to explain organized complexity adequately is in terms of something really simple? No. That would be crazy. Explanations come as we get them. Sometimes you explain complexity in terms of other complexity. Sometimes ec complexity in terms of simplicity. It's just all over the map. There's no special rule that the only good science is stuff that explains complexity in terms of simplicity. But when you can get it, it's a sign of a beautiful theory. Let's just put it that way for now. So that's the thing about evolution. And then he complains that theism has no hope of doing this. Theism doesn't explain organized complexity because the divine mind is highly complex. And hence, just more organized complexity. Now, the thing that you have to do is tie this notion of how explanations work in some way to what we have evidence for. So the next move is to say, the simplicity of the evolutionary theory as opposed to the theistic hypothesis in some way counts in favor of, provides evidence for the evolutionary explanation over the theistic one for explaining the kinds of organized complexity that we have. And hence, there's maybe no evidence for theism or at least less evidence for theism than there is for the hypothesis that what we see is the product of unguided evolution. Okay, so that's his more direct argument on the theistic alternative to the unguided evolution picture. Here's a first response to that argument. There's a problem with it because, like any good scientist, he's not going to use this word, phrase, organized complexity without telling you what it means. And here's what he says about it. Something is complex if it has parts that are arranged in a way that's unlikely to have arisen by chance alone. Okay? Now remember, he said the divine mind was highly complex. Do you remember that? That was part of the argument on the last slide. Um, that conflicts with his official definition. The claim that the God hypothesis, I don't like using that phrase, but he does, so I'm going to use it. God is not a hypothesis. But I'll just talk that way, okay? Just get past that. The claim that the God hypothesis involves massive complexity is questionable. Why think God has parts at all? I mean, machines have parts. Physical objects have parts. God is neither a machine nor a physical object. Why think God has any parts? 
So if God has no parts, there's no way for God, for the God hypothesis to count as a highly complex hypothesis. Um, now, if you're Dawkins, you might say, look, that's just missing the point. The complexity in the God hypothesis is not that he has parts in that way, but that the divine mind is highly complex itself. Why? Because God knows infinitely many things. And that's about as complex as anything can possibly be. All right, now I have to do a little bit of technical epistemology. So are you ready? All right. There are, let's just limit it to two fundamental kinds of knowledge that you can have. One let's call propositional knowledge, the other I'll call objectual. And because people who are sophisticated and educated like Latin, we're going to use the phrase de re, of the object, for the second kind of knowledge. Propositional knowledge is where you say, I know that, and then I fill in the blank with a whole sentence. Right? I know that my mother loves me. I know that my wife is embarrassed by me sometimes. Right? Various things like that. Right? Those are whole sentences, and that's why it's called propositional knowledge. You could call it sentential knowledge, too, if you wanted. Um, knowledge of an object is different than that. Um, I know Brandon. I know Paul. I know Steve. Right? I know various people. Well, what do you know about him? Well, I know of Brandon that he's married to Leanne. Now, that is objectual knowledge. Okay? We get different kinds of knowledge. There's an interesting question about how those two kinds of knowledge are related to each other, and we don't need to get into that. I want to focus just on the objectual knowledge. So in particular, I want you to think about knowledge of a landmark. Maybe it's El Capitan in the Grand Tetons, right? Or Yosemite, wherever that thing is. Maybe it's Mount Rushmore. Uh, maybe it's the Empire State Building. Maybe it's the Evangel Administration Building. Some world famous landmark, right? So you have knowledge of a landmark. And you originally acquired that knowledge by a direct experience. Maybe you went to South Dakota, went and saw Mount Rushmore. And you can probably, if you ever did that, you can recall the experience via memory, OK? Now, the knowledge that you have, your knowledge of that landmark, is one thing. We can describe it in as many different ways as we want. Uh, I'm not sure I can get this right, but um, Washington's up there. I'm doing Mount Rushmore, right? Washington's up there, Lincoln's up there, Roosevelt's up there. Who's the fourth? <coughs> Who is it? Jefferson. Jefferson? All right, and if I had a good memory, I could tell you who's to the left, right? But I can't. But there's all sorts of individual things that I know that can be abstracted away from that initial experiential awareness of Mount Rushmore and my subsequent memory of it. The day ray knowledge that I have is one thing. One single thing. It's just, boom, it's sort of like the experience I have when I just stand here and just go, wow, look at all these people. Right? It's one simple awareness. It's not simple. It's got all sorts of informational content to it, but it is one experience. It's not infinitely many experiences all at once. And what I do from it is I can abstract various pieces of information that I want. That's how the senses work. So knowledge de re of a landmark is, can be a very simple thing in spite of the fact that it's got perhaps infinitely complex information contained in the one thing. So we can correctly characterize the state of mind in question in terms of specific items of information that are potentially unlimited, giving an appearance of complexity even though we know that the underlying reality is simple. It's just one experience, right? Now, I think that's the right way to think about God's unsurpassable knowledge of what he's created. 
It's best thought of as the most intimate, immediate awareness of the totality of his creation, compatible with there being a distinction in being between God and his creation. If you don't add the, that last part, then it turns out creation might be, you might be forced to say the universe is part of God, right? Or the universe itself is God. I don't want to say that. We can talk about later, if, if you're attracted to pantheism, we can talk about that, but um, I'm not going to go there. So that's what the last clause is meant to rule out. It is the most intimate and immediate awareness of the totality. That's one thing. From that, you can abstract out unlimited amounts of information. But it doesn't follow that the one thing is really infinitely many things because you can abstract out that way. So I don't think the reply on Dawkins' behalf is very penetrating. It is true that God knows infinitely many things, but it doesn't follow that the God hypothesis is infinitely complex because of that. As such, the complexity of infinite knowledge is compatible with an underlying simple unified reality. Here's a deeper response. Just think about the connections between rationality and knowledge and the notion of evidence that's tied to explanatory power in the way Dawkins required, right? Dawkins said, evolution is simple. We explain complexity in terms of simplicity, and that's a virtue of a theory. It's a good making feature of a scientific theory when you reduce complexity to simplicity. Here's a really interesting question though. Why think that's a guide to truth? Why is simplicity a guide to truth? Here's an alternative story that you might tell. You have approximately a three pound brain. So do I. There are slight differences in total ounces between us, but that's it. How much do you expect? How much work can a three pound brain do? A lot. But it has limitations. You can get system overload. There's only so much stuff that can be going on at one time. Our attempt to understand and control the universe requires requires that we favor simple hypotheses over complex ones. Why? Because you only have a three pound brain, right? Don't forget you only got a three pound brain. Try that with Brandon next logic class, you flunk. <laughs> Say, Brandon, it's only a three pound brain, give me a break. He won't buy it because of course everybody who passed also has a, just a three pound brain, but it's worth a try. So it's not clear that simplicity really is a guide to truth. It can be a guide to good theorizing in science without being tied to truth in that way because we have practical limitations on our abilities to compute and manipulate. And if we want to do science both to understand and to be able to predict and control what happens around us, we have to have manageable theories. Automatically, that gets you favoring simple hypotheses over more complex ones. Um, second point, the underlying epistemology. Epistemology is the theory of knowledge. The epistemology that Dawkins is appealing to is hopeless because explanations have to come to an end at some point. Or else, you're going to get an infinite regress. Each level of explanation would require evidence from a more basic explanation which would require further explanation from an even more basic level, and you just have to keep going down. The question is, where do you stop this process? And why do you stop it? Well, one idea would be you only get to stop when you get to the most simple hypothesis possible. But that's, of course, a crazy requirement. Lots of simple things are explained by other simple things, right? So there's no reason to stop just because you get to a simple hypothesis. And there's also no reason to insist that you get to a simple hypothesis. So suppose you grant that appealing to the existence of God, the most perfect being there could be. Suppose you grant that that's a very complex explanation of everything. Just say so. Why is that not a suitable stopping point? I don't know what he'll say, but it sounds like 
you're going to launch a regress. And that's not good. The other thing is that this point is so basic to the entire history of epistemology that it would take somebody who doesn't know much at all about philosophy to make this kind of mistake. The threat of infinite regress was known at least as far back as Aristotle, which is 320 to 350 BC, somewhere in that range. That's a long time ago. So that reminds me of our earlier ad hominem argument about expertitis. It's sometimes best not to launch into diatribes outside your area of expertise. You tend to look foolish. So let's turn to somebody who's supposed to be better, Dennett, because he looks like Aristotle. I'm going to talk only about the part of Dennett where he addresses the fine-tuning version of the design argument. The reason I'm going to talk about that is because um, even though I'm not a fan of these arguments for the existence of God, I think they do not do the work that they're supposed to do. I don't think they're generally very good arguments. And I don't think the rationality of any person depends on there being such an argument. So everything I'm going to say is irrelevant from my point of view. But I'm going to talk about it anyway because he talks about it. I do think this is the most interesting one of all, though. And um, I think when you talk to non-theist philosophers across America and in Western Europe, if you ask them what's the most powerful argument for the existence of God that there is, they'll almost always say the fine-tuning version of the design argument. So it's the one that they find the most impressive. So let's look at that. Here's how the argument goes. Consider the exquisite fine-tuning of a wide variety of fundamental <coughs> constants. The speed of light, the gravitational constant, the strength of strong and weak nuclear forces. Slight changes to any of these constants makes life impossible. Change the speed of light just a little bit. You wouldn't have the conditions necessary for life to arise. These facts, the argument goes, make probable that the world was designed. Make probable that the world was designed. They don't guarantee anything, but they make it probable. Okay, that's going to turn out to be very important. The argument is probabilistic, not deductive, and everybody working on this argument has made it clear that it's a probabilistic argument rather than a deductive one. Now, I'm going to explain that because even though I expect most of you know what that difference is, maybe some of you don't. A deductive argument is one where if the premises are true, it's impossible that the conclusion is false. Probabilistic arguments aren't like that. They don't have that truth-preserving characteristic. So if you know that 99.9% .9 of evangel students are beautiful and holy at the same time, that's evidence that Brandon used to be beautiful and holy. I wanted a student's name, but I couldn't remember one all of a sudden, right? He used to be one, so there was a time. Now that's a probabilistic argument. Does it guarantee that there was a time when he was, even if, suppose the premise is true, does it guarantee? No. It doesn't guarantee, it just makes it highly likely. Now, Dennett doesn't like that argument. He doesn't think it works at all. Here's what he says. He says, look, it's possible, this is the multiverse hypothesis. Multi rather than uni-verse. So you get lots of universes in sequence. It's possible that there's been an evolution of worlds in the sense of whole universes, and the world we find ourselves in is simply one among the countless others that have existed throughout all eternity. Now, the sample space, the number of possibilities here is infinite. So there are infinitely many possibilities. Since ours is one of them, think of all the possible values for the fundamental constants. Ours is one of them. And if you have an infinite amount of time, you get an infinite sample space. So not surprising that ours showed up at some point. Now what's important here is this first qualifier. It is possible that. He's not claiming that he has a scientific proof or body of evidence that confirms the multiverse hypothesis. He's just saying that could be true. 
And if that's true, there's nothing surprising about why this universe exists. After all, you'd expect it to occur. All right, so here's some, um, there, <laughs> I have names for different logic courses. Baby logic is what you take after critical reasoning, and it's baby logic because you need mental competence of a little more than a baby to master it. It's, it's really not hard. It takes effort, but it's not, right, when your mental age is about 12, you're ready to do it. So, baby logic. What I want to explain is the difference between monotonic logics and non-monotonic logics. If you're in computer science, you understand this language. A monotonic inference, think of the word monotone, right? If you sing like this, switch majors if you're in music. Monotone means it does not change. What that means in the context of logic is if you have a sequence of premises that provide support for the conclusion in a way that can't be undermined by adding additional premises to the ones you have, the argument is monotone. So it turns out that only works for deductive systems. In a deductive system, if you have premises that entail the conclusion, you can add anything you want. You can learn anything else you want and add it to the premises, that conclusion will still follow. I'll give you an example. Um, if, uh, I, I gotta, I'm gonna pick one with true premises this time. Um, it doesn't matter if the premises are true or not, because we're only talking about whether the conclusion follows, but, um, if Jonah was swallowed by a fish, he was not swallowed by a mammal, by a whale, excuse me. Not by a mammal either. If Jonah was swallowed by a f fish, he was not swallowed by a whale. He was swallowed by a fish. That's what the story says. So he wasn't swallowed by a whale. Now add any information you want to those two premises. One was a conditional. If it's a fish, it's not a whale. And the second one was, it's a fish. You're stuck with the conclusion. I don't care what you add to the premises. Even if you add the contradictory of something that's in the premises. You keep those two premises, that conclusion will always follow no matter how much additional information you add. That means it's a monotonic argument, okay? A non-monotonic argument is one where that's not true. Additional information added to the premises can undermine the support provided by that premise for that conclusion. So go back to the Brandon case. 99.9% .9 of Evangel students are holy and good looking, at least at some point in their lives. But Brandon was also a football, football player, right? And you know that none of them are both holy and good looking. <laughs> now add that piece of information into the piece I had about Evangel students in general. What follows about Brandon? Now nothing. Well, I said no. I should have said like 0.0001% of football players are both holy and good looking. Um, right? Now nothing at all follows. You can't conclude anything about whether he was ever good looking and holy. Right? So that's a non-monotonic inference from the first 99.9% .9 probabilistic fact to the conclusion. That turns out to be the central difference between a deductive and a non-deductive argument. And remember, the design argument is not a deductive argument. So the key difference is new information can undermine one of these, the probabilistic arguments, but not the other. Now, go back to the possibility claims. What could adding a possibility claim show? A possibility claim can show that a deductive argument isn't valid truth preserving, but it's irrelevant to a non-deductive argument. That's the connection between possibility claims and the monotonicity, non-monotonicity point that I was making. So let's use an example. Suppose you reasoned this way and thought this was a truth preserving inference. <clears throat> Uh, 
Um, I used to think this was true when I was real little. If somebody's a woman, they can't be a man. Now, I will let you tinker with the details of man and woman there, right? However you want. But I used to think that was true. And I met Susan Hale. And Susan Hale was a woman. Now, you all don't know Susan Hale, which is good because you're going to learn something about Susan that if you knew who she was, I would not be telling the story. Susan became Jake. Now, I'm going to insist that you tinker in such a way that Jake Hale is a man. Do you understand what happened to Susan? Right? Susan always felt like a man, which I've, I don't know what that feels like. But um, right? it's just not an experience I've ever had. You probably, if you're a guy, you've never had that experience. If you have, I'd like to know what it is. I mean, I feel like me, but I don't feel like a Norwegian. I don't feel like a man. I don't feel like a human being. I know I am all of those things, but it's, I don't have any such feeling. But she claimed it, and maybe so, but I don't know what, I have no idea what that's like, right? She always felt like a man, and now she's a man, right? So um, I, met, I met Susan, and it would seem to follow from my pieces of information. If you're a woman, you'll never be a man. She's a woman, so she'll never be a man. And she turns out to be an actual counterexample to my first premise, right? If you add the information that transgenderism is possible, note possible, it turns out, well, it's kind of more than possible, right? Some people actually do it. So, but the mere possibility would be enough to undermine that first premise, right? So if you take mere possibilities, you can show that an argument doesn't work. The most famous in the history of philosophy is Plantinga's um, free will defense against the problem of evil, if you've seen that. So here's the way the argument goes. The a theologian says evil exists, therefore God doesn't. And that's a valid deductive argument. And Plantinga says, no, it's not. Because consider this possibility claim. God has created people. It's merely possible that God has created people who he knows will misbehave and cause evil in the world. And from those two premises, evil exists and the God has created people with certain capacities, it follows that God exists, not that he doesn't exist, right? So you add a piece, a mere possibility claim to the claim that evil exists, and you reverse what conclusion follows. And what does that show? That shows that the argument was not a good deductive argument. It was not a truth-preserving inference. So here's the takeaway lesson I want you to notice. If you cite possibility stuff, you must be thinking the argument you're attacking is a deductive argument. Because the only inferences it could be relevant to would be ones where the premises were supposed to guarantee the truth of the conclusion. So Dennett's response is an embarrassing failure for a philosopher. It's a failure to take into account these baby logic facts, because he cites he knows that argument is not intended to be a deductive argument. It's a probability argument. And yet, he counters with some possibility claims. Possibility claims are only relevant to undermining a claim that something is a deductive or truth-preserving inference. Right? So if the defender of the design, fine-tuning version of the design argument said, look at this stuff. Given the fine-tuning of the concept, constants, it's absolutely impossible that there's not a God. Absolutely impossible. It follows with deductive certainty that there is a God. But they didn't say that. They said this provides strong probabilistic evidence for the existence of God. And then when you counter with a possibility claim, the defender of the argument should go, well, I already admitted that, right? The possibility claim is completely irrelevant to the argument that I just gave. What were you thinking? That's the proper response to Dennett's attack on the fine-tuning version of the design argument. So here's my conclusion. First, 
Um, I think this has to be said in context. I think you all have noticed that public discourse is an embarrassment in America recently. I don't know what's true in the rest of the world, but public discourse is just simply totally uncivil. When you listen to Democrats and Republicans talk about each other and to each other, it's, I mean, it's the sort of thing my grandma would have kicked you out of her kitchen for doing, right? I don't care if it's 40 below out, you're not gonna talk like that in here. Um, so civility has plummeted in public discourse. And I think aggressive atheism is just part of that general phenomenon. Um, we aren't winning the argument. We aren't winning the hearts and minds of the people we're talking to. So I'm gonna talk louder. It's kind of like thinking, you know, never mind. All right, so it's part of that general phenomenon. It's also caused by us because we do marginalize and discriminate against people that are not Christians and not theists in particular. Um, it's the death knell for your public office candidacy if you admit to being an atheist. You simply can't do that. No, but you can't get elected. I'm not remarking about your voting patterns. I am remarking about our discriminatory and marginalizing behavior, because that's wrong. Just think of the example of Jesus. Who were the people most marginalized in, the, in his society? The people he partied with, right? He parties with publicans and sinners. Who does he attack? Who is he harshest with? The Pharisees. Jesus is not a marginalizer. He's not a discriminator. He reaches out to people. He befriends them. He goes to parties with them. We do not do that sort of thing. And we are responsible in large part. I mean, we're not, it's not to absolve people who are hostile unnecessarily. It's not to absolve them of responsibility. But we cause this sort of thing by our behavior. We say to such people, as my daughter said about Whitney, I just want them to go away forever, right? Our behavior tells people that all the time, and it's really a bad thing. So we need to take responsibility for that. I think it's also uh, important to notice that the aggression displayed by the new atheists is not matched by quality of argumentation. That's what I've been trying to demonstrate today. Um, our response, I think, should be a couple of things. There's no adequate Christian response that doesn't to do two things. One is the kind of thing I talked about today. We have to present and defend the philosophical case that the ratio of bluster to substance is off the charts, which is true. Um, this just is not very good philosophy by any of these people. Second, we need to acknowledge the marginalizing role of organized Christianity in producing a context in which hostile rhetoric, or worse, is an expected consequence, and stand in opposition to it, to the marginalizing and discriminatory behavior that Christians have engaged in with respect to people who don't share our view. Here's our mandate. And I'm going to make up a new word because my mandate, mandates are supposed to be pithy, simple, carry them in your hip pocket. This isn't one of it, one of them. So it needs pithifying. Here's the first part. It's not our job to make Christians of atheists. It is our job to be faithful witnesses of the good news that offers life and hope to all. We are supposed to present good news. We're supposed to be faithful witnesses who show respect for those who remain unmoved, always. Leaving the outcome in the hands of providence. Thank you. <laughs>